Hi, I'm Leah Rauch. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Director of Education at Illinois Holocaust Museum. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, our board of directors, volunteers, and staff, I would like to thank you for being here for our program, Beyond Borders, LGBTQ Refugees, Immigrants, and Human Rights Today. The mission of Illinois Holocaust Museum is expressed in our founding principle. Remember the past, transform the future. We do that by using the lessons of the Holocaust to combat hatred, prejudice, and indifference today. And while the Holocaust is the core focus of the work we do, we also address broader social justice and human rights issues, such as those affecting the LGBTQ community. Illinois Holocaust Museum was founded by immigrants and refugees who came to the US fleeing Nazi persecution or wanting to build a new life after losing nearly everything and everyone in the Holocaust. And the topic of this program is one that is also very personal to me as I'm part of the LGBTQ plus community and my family immigrated to the US earlier this year. We were very lucky thanks to having a couple of amazing attorneys who helped me and my family through the process. But we also had a taste of inequality and injustice. And we had to endure being separated for what was then an unknown period of time. But my family's experiences are just a shadow of what others have to endure. When I heard the museum would host the exhibition Rise Up Stonewall and the LGBTQ rights movement, I immediately thought of possibly hosting a public program to bring awareness to these issues. And I'd like to thank Raheem Thompson, our manager of public programs for putting together this incredible panel and making this program happen tonight. I also want to give a special thanks to our community partners listed at the start of the program. I'd now like to introduce the moderator of the panel today. Beck Earl is a paralegal with National Immigrant Justice Center's LGBT Immigrant Rights Initiative and previously worked as a paralegal on the Immigrant Legal Defense Project. Beck graduated from Knox College with a degree in modern languages. During their time at Knox, they conducted a year-long study on interpreting and translation services for multilingual families, language rights, and family school collaborative partnerships. They volunteered with the Dilly Pro Bono Project as a legal assistant and Spanish interpreter at the South Texas Family Residential Center. Beck has volunteered with the Immigrant Justice Campaign as an interpreter for their remote bond team and with Illinois Legal Aid Online as a Spanish translator. Welcome, Beck. Thank you very much for that introduction. And now I would like to introduce the rest of our panelists who we have tonight. Um, so we have with us Carolina Lopez, who is a Mexican transgender woman who is the current director of Mariposa Sin Fronteras, an organization that provides support to LGBTQ people in immigration detention centers in the United States. We also have Pauline Park, a Korean transgender woman who was the first openly trans person chosen to be Grand Marshal of the New York City Pride March, and Lindley Edges, current legal director at the Transgender Law Center, also known as TLC, and former legal director at the Sex Workers Project at the Urban Justice Center. And my name is Beck Earl. I am the pro bono coordinator for the LGBT project at the National Immigrant Justice Center. And we also have Robin Reagan from Knox College interpreting. All right, so let's get started then on some of the questions that we have for our wonderful panelists. Uh, so our first question is for Lindley. Um, Lindley, can you tell us a bit about TLC's border project and the issues facing LGBT migrants at the border. Awesome, thank you so much, Beck. Um, so uh, about two years ago, um, Transgender Law Center partnered with Familia as well as a bunch of other organizations um, to, to basically open up a border project um, at the US um, and uh, the Tijuana and California border. This project was really to focus on honestly, 
making sure that the work that was already happening um, by so many LGBT people um, actually got funded um, because there have been so many people supporting LGBT migrants both in Mexico um, and all over the world um, as well as in the United States but oftentimes that work goes unfunded because it's usually run by uh, trans women of color who um, don't always get the funding they deserve for the amazing work that they do. So over the past two years we built this program where we work with shelters in Mexico with um, health services in Mexico um, and we have attorneys and um, organizers and humanitarian um, coordinators to ensure that um, LGBT migrants who are coming in will um, will actually have the support. Initially, when this project started, um, a lot of people were being detained. And so we were hoping that by helping prepare their cases while in Mexico, while waiting, because that wait at that time was anywhere from six to nine months of sitting there in Tijuana, um, that we could actually help prepare those cases as quickly as possible. And so that the people wouldn't be spending as much time in immigration detention. Um, with COVID, that, all, uh, that, that went away because the border closed, um, but we continue to do work and since over the past two years, we've actually helped um, over 350 LGBT people um, come into the United States, provided humanitarian support, um, and basically um, help find lawyers and help ensure that they get the services and support that they need both in Tijuana as well as in the United States. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so our next question is going to be for Carolina. Um, Carolina, can you tell us about the work that you do at Mariposas Sin Fronteras? ¿Nos puede contar un poco sobre su trabajo en Mariposas Sin Fronteras? Uh, sí, claro. Gracias por el espacio. Mi nombre es Carolina López. Mis pronombres son ella. Thank you for the space to talk today. Uh, my name is Carolina López and my pronouns are she. Uh, el grupo en el que estoy, o sea, uh, soy directora en estos momentos y nosotros apoyamos a la comunidad LGBT dentro y fuera de las detenciones de inmigración aquí en Tucson, Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here with the group. I am the director of the group. We uh, help LGBT individuals both in and outside of detention here in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, el grupo se formó en el 2011 con la finalidad de poder ayudar a la comunidad LGBT más a la comunidad transgénero. The group was formed in 20, 2011 with the purpose of helping LGBT individuals, especially uh, with the focus on trans. Eh, y empezamos a ayudar con uh, pagándoles fianzas, uh, pagándoles fianzas, ayudándoles a, a conseguir a uh, patrocinadores y cartas de, de uh, Cartas que le pudieran ayudar a, a salir de una detención. We started up trying, started trying to get financial assistance and also finding um, money for bond and for sponsors and letters of support so that they could be released. Uh, en nuestro grupo es un grupo sin fines de lucro. Entonces lo que hacemos es apoyar a la comunidad a, a poder este, llevar a su proceso más flexible. Our group is nonprofit, and we support the community through the process, trying to make it more flexible. Uh, tenemos dos programas muy importantes que son eh, el programa de cartas y visitas, o sea, hacemos visitas y, y mandamos cartas. We have two different um, branches of the program. One has to do with letters and visits. Y también tenemos el programa de, de la casa. Uh, tenemos una casa que tiene ocho cuartos para poder a ver, a, a recibir a personas que van saliendo de detención y, y, ten, y puedan salir en un lugar seguro aquí en Tucson, Arizona. The other part has to do with uh, a house. We have eight rooms in order to house people when they get out of detention here in Tucson, Arizona. En estos momentos la casa está en construcción. Eh, estamos remodelando, reconstruyendo la casa. Necesitamos mucha ayuda en estos momentos para poder reconstruirla. Right now, the house is under construction. We're going through a remodeling project, and so we need a lot of help to get through that remodel. También uh, sabemos que, bueno, el, el año pasado fue un año muy difícil. 
uh, para, para Todex, entonces lo que eh, estuvo cerrado las detenciones, o sea, no nos dejaban hacer visitas, pero pudimos apoyar a la comunidad afuera de, la, de las detenciones, o sea, apoyamos con uh, pagándoles sus biles. Also, we know that it's been a really difficult year this past year and that we weren't able to do visits inside the detention center because it was closed. So we've been providing support um, on the outside of detention, helping people like with paying their bills. Y también ya tenemos dos años mandándole 100 dólares de comisaria a cada detenido. And also we've been helping out over the last two years with sending $100 to commissary accounts. Um, y podemos y pues apoyamos en lo que podemos aquí estamos para apoyar y ayudar a la comunidad en general we help in any way we can we're here to support the community pero pues nuestra prioridad siempre ha sido la comunidad transgénero eh, de color también our apoyamos priority has always, our priority has always been transgender people of color en esos momentos también estamos haciendo seis, eh, tenemos seis talleres para para hacer conciencia de cómo uh, vivir y empoderar a la comunidad LGBT y transgénero uh, con VIH. We also have the six different workshops to raise awareness about those um, LGBT people living with HIV. Wonderful, yes, thank you for sharing that with us, Carolina. Okay, thank you. Gra gracias por el espacio. Thank you for the space. Gracias a usted, Carolina. Muchísimas gracias por compartir sus experiencias con nosotros. Um, so then next we have Pauline Park. Um, Pauline, can you also tell us about the work that you do at the New York Association for Gender Rights Advocacy? Uh, thanks so much, Beck. I'm really uh, honored and delighted to be able to participate in this important discussion. Um, I co-founded Niagara, the New York Association for Gender Rights Advocacy, with several other transgender activists back in 1998 uh, to advocate on behalf of uh, the transgender community. It was actually the first statewide transgender advocacy organization in New York. Uh, when we uh, founded it back in 1998. And our focus has been twofold. It's been on legislative work and it's been on public education. And you can understand that the two are inextricably linked. Uh, one supports the other. Uh, we're probably best known for having led the campaign for the transgender rights law enacted by the New York City Council in April 2002. Uh, but we also uh, were instrumental in getting gender identity and expression into the uh, Dignity for All Students Act, which was the anti-bullying safe schools bill that was enacted by the uh, state legislature a decade ago, uh, which became the first legislation enacted by the state legislature uh, to include uh, transgender specific language. Um, the other thing that we do is public education and that focuses particularly on transgender sensitivity trainings. We've done transgender sensitivity training sessions for a wide variety of different organizations from small community-based uh, groups uh, to social service and healthcare providers, corporations, and government agencies. I'll mention one other thing, which is uh, the current focus of our legislative work, uh, which is working uh, in uh, a coalition that's been organized by Red Canary Song to advance uh, the decriminalization of sex work under New York state law, which is really vitally important because the fact is whether or not you're actually engaged in sex work, if the police uh, read you, if the police perceive you as being transgender, they may harass you uh, and even arrest you under state uh, prostitution laws uh, whether or not you're actually engaged in sex work. So decriminalization of sex work would have a hugely beneficial impact uh, for members of the community. Uh, I would say that's particularly true for uh, immigrants, particularly the undocumented. And uh, here in New York, which is the largest and most diverse uh, city in the country, of course, we have a very large immigrant population. I live in the borough of Queens, which is more than 50% uh, non-US born, uh, the most eth ethnically diverse uh, county in the United States. I actually live in Jackson Heights, which is, according to uh, the uh, recent uh, demographic report, 
the uh, most demographically diverse spot on planet Earth. And so uh, decriminalization of sex work would have a huge impact, uh, particularly for uh, trans people of color, immigrants. We have a very large population of immigrants from all over the world, but particularly from Asia and Latin America. Thank you, Pauline. Yeah. And then kind of going back to Lindley as well, um, can you tell us about some of the policies and practices impacting LGBT migrants' ability to seek asylum in the United States? Yeah, absolutely. So as people may or may not know, the border is currently closed. Um, it is very difficult to enter uh, because of something called Title 42. That's a public health law actually connected to COVID. Um, and uh, people in our own government have said it's actually not necessary, but you know, they keep it, um, they keep using it anyway. So right now what's happening is our government restarted a program called MPP, or sometimes people call it a remain in Mexico policy, where people stay in Mexico um, and in theory are able to fight their case. Um, and have access to US courts. Um, recently, a new policy has come out. Or, take two of, of this MPP policy, but basically what it says is that LGBT people are not safe in Mexico and therefore should not, should be exempt from having to be part of this MPP or remain in Mexico policy, which is a good thing. Both the Mexican government as well as the US government both agree it isn't safe for LGBT people in Mexico. However, there is actually no way for LGBT migrants to access the asylum process because of Title 42. So some people not who are, who are not LGBT are actually able to go through the asylum process through this MPP program, which we are not advocating for. It is actually not a good program, but it's actually completely almost impossible for LGBT migrants to leave Mexico, even though our government as well as the Mexican government have said it's unsafe. So it's a little confusing about why these policies and how these policies have been put in place. But right now in Tijuana, we have probably over 150 project participants in pretty dire restraints. The other issue that we're seeing is the use of immigration detention. We already know transgender people cannot be safely held in immigration detention. Multiple transgender people have died or in some ways have been murdered in immigration detention. Johanna Medina, Roxana Hernandez, we know that ICE cannot keep transgender people safe. And even outside of people dying in immigration detention, LGBT people are actually 97 times more likely to be sexually assaulted in immigration detention compared to non-LGBT. So we have this information and we've provided it to the government and even provided options for some amazing programs that can happen. But unfortunately, even though we know that ending trans detention is the way to go, we are not seeing a lot of movement on it right now. The other big issue that we see is honestly connecting to transgender trafficking survivors. We know that when um, someone who is cisgender um, is identified as a trafficking survivor, they're usually let out of detention, maybe given a hug, helped um, get access to all the benefits that they're entitled to under the law. But we see over and over and over again that transgender survivors of trafficking are actually just left in detention for years at a time with ICE and sometimes other agencies refusing to actually release them even when they have been identified as trafficking survivors by our own federal government like the FBI, like Homeland Security Investigations. So it's actually just this double standard for transgender survivors of trafficking. So those are a couple of the big issues that we're seeing that are facing LGBT asylum seekers in the United States and in Mexico right now. Thank you, Lindley. And then building off of Lindley's points, um, Carolina, what kind of conditions do you see in immigration detention in your work at Mariposas Sin Fronteras for LGBT immigrants specifically? Carolina, para seguir la conversación en su trabajo en Mariposas Sin Fronteras, ¿cómo son las condiciones de detención que ha visto para los inmigrantes LGBT? Bueno, sí, gracias. Eh, no, no es que yo haya visto también, he vivido, eh, viví en carne propia eh, una detención por tres años y medio con hombres. Entonces, eh, ahí 
me di cuenta, bueno, desde antes yo ya me había dado cuenta, yo no creo en gobiernos, yo no creo en cárceles, yo no creo en detenciones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's not just what I've seen, it's what I've lived with my own flesh. I spent three and a half years in, in prison with men. And it was even before that that I realized I don't believe in governments and I don't believe in prisons. And estoy 100% consciente y segura de que ICE no tiene la capacidad para tener a ningún ser humano seguro dentro, dentro de una detención de migración. I'm 100% aware and sure of the fact that ICE cannot keep any human being safe. Más porque eh, eh, yo recibí golpes, amenazas de muerte, me escupían, y no nada más a mí, a mis compañeras transgénero también. And also because I received beatings and threats, I was spit at, and not just me, all of my other transgender um, companions. Es, es, una, es, una, es un abuso verbal, psicológico, uh, eh, eh, emocional, eh, toda clase de abuso existe en esas detenciones para la comunidad LGBT y tres veces más para la comunidad transgénero. It's a lots of types of abuse, psychological, emotional, all kinds, especially for LGBT and three times worse for trans people. Y no, y no nada más por parte de los detenidos, por parte de los oficiales también. And not just by other detainees, but by the officials as well. Entonces, uh, no, no porque yo haya visto a mis compañeras sufrir, sino porque yo también lo viví dentro de una detención de migración. Mm -hmm. So again, not just because I've seen, but also because I've lived through it myself. Gracias, Carolina, por compartir esto con nosotros y por compartir sus experiencias tan personales con con esta audiencia. Sí, bueno, sí, el, el maltrato psicológico es el que más duele, el, la, las, las, el maltrato psicológico verbal y, y los golpes que recibí. Ya tengo nueve años, ya voy a hacer diez años que yo salí de un centro de detención y hasta la fecha eh, siento y, 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 y pienso en esos, en esos momentos que viví dentro de una detención. The psychological mistreatment and abuse is what hurts the most, you know, those kinds of beatings as well. Nine, 10 years have gone by already and I still feel very much um, the pain from that time period. Sí, claro, eso es algo que nadie debe de vivir. Exactamente, no, nadie debe de vivir y nadie debe experimentar y menos una mujer transgénero que viene, que quiere sobrevivir, que viene de un país eh, recibiendo esta misma clase de amenazas, esta misma clase de, de golpes y viene a un país para, para hacer una vida, para sobrevivir, para vivir. That's right. No one should ever have to live through that or experience that uh, more, especially a trans woman, especially because I came from a country where I already had that kind of abuse and um, threats and beatings. Someone who wants to just come to this country to live and survive and keep living. Sí, claro, estoy completamente de acuerdo con usted, Carolina. Y pues muchísimas gracias por compartir esto con nosotros otra vez. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Carolina. So then turning to Pauline, building off of this conversation on transgender rights and transgender health specifically, based on your advocacy work in transgender health care, can you tell us what do you see as some of the biggest barriers to healthcare equity for LGBT people and how can that be overcome? Well, I think the first thing to recognize when I do transgender sensitivity trainings is that most people think of transgender access to healthcare uh, exclusively or primarily with regard to access to hormones and sex reassignment surgery and gender related uh, gender transition related procedures. While that's vitally important and indeed life saving for many members of the community to access, that's only a small fraction of the problem. Uh, trans people face enormous impediments trying to access healthcare in general. Uh, 
Uh, many trans people are uninsured or underinsured, which is one reason why my personal position as well as my organizational work uh, focuses on advocating for uh, universal health care, truly universal health care, um, and why I personally support Medicare for all. Uh, it's uh, also a case of when I do transgender sensitivity trainings, making people realize it's not simply the medical providers themselves, as important it is, as it is in terms of interaction with doctors and nurses. Trans people face discrimination, um, disregard, impediments with regard to uh, their interactions across the spectrum. Uh, if you go into a hospital, healthcare uh, setting, clinic, doctor's office, uh, things that non-trans people might not think of. So since many, perhaps majority of trans people in this country have government issued ID that doesn't necessarily match their uh, gender identity and expression, uh, what happens when they fill out a form? If they sit in a waiting room and they have their name called, their legal name called, even though they do not use that name, even though that name may be gendered uh, differently from the gender identity they identify with. So there's really literally hundreds of impediments that a trans person can face when attempting to access health care. And so training is vitally important, but that requires a commitment on the part of healthcare providers, social service providers, government agencies, corporations, universities, colleges, et cetera. Um, what I find in my experience is it doesn't necessarily take that much to persuade an organization or an institution that they would benefit from the training. What really takes an effort is getting, uh, persuading them to make the, the fiscal commitment to pay for an experienced trainer. They think they can either get it for free or they think that because they happen to have one transgendered or genderqueer person on staff, they can just get that person to kind of informally train uh, the rest of the staff. Um, those are both really big mistakes because um, as the saying goes, you get what you pay for. So in order to educate the public on healthcare access, you need competent training by experienced trainers who know how to educate the public in a way that really engages them. And um, that public education never ends because, for example, if you do a training like we did with uh, a major hospital in the city, there's staff turnover all the time. So you have to constantly be retraining people because there will be new people coming in and older people leaving. So those are just some of the challenges. Um, all too often trans people are forced to become their own advocates, even though they may not themselves have the medical or legal background uh, or professional background to ad, uh, uh, adequately and effectively advocate for themselves. Uh, some institutions are starting to set up uh, a, an ombudsperson role on staff to help advocate for trans people, uh, but that's still a very, very rare uh, situation. In most cases, there's no one in a hospital healthcare setting, social service provider setting, uh, who is trained, competent, and committed to advocate on behalf of trans and gender non-conforming, genderqueer or non-binary people uh, as patients or as clients. And that really needs to change if we're to uh, enable uh, trans folks to access healthcare. Absolutely. Thank you, Pauline, for sharing that with us. Um, so then, Lindley, can you tell us more about what are some of the issues that LGBT migrants face who are living in the United States superficially connected to criminalization? You kind of spoke to this in one of the earlier questions as well, but would be curious to hear more about that. Oh, Lindley, you're mute. Oh, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, I think it's also, it's really important for us to understand the impact criminalization has on people's lives um, and the laws that, and policies that are actually created to target trans people, whether or not they're engaging in legal or illegal activity. Um, you know, I, I say that, I say this often, but I, it's really important to actually understand that because the minute someone ends up with a criminal conviction, it actually can have an impact on the rest of their asylum case, the rest of their immigration case, and could actually make it almost impossible to um, to gain lawful legal status here in the United States. And we see these types of um, criminalization all the time. Um, Pauline and I have worked together for a number of years, and we've both done a lot of work in Queens together. Um, and the impact of criminalization of walking while trans, about uh, trans women being targeted for sex work related arrests, it's pretty horrific. And then on top of that, it's this repeated targeting um, and people actually being told that they must plead guilty or they're gonna get sent to a prison or a jail where they're gonna be held with um, for a trans woman with a cis, with cis men. And so it actually forces people to plead guilty. And then in the whole same aspect of that, there isn't even a second thought to be like, oh wait, is everything okay here? Should we take a step back and see um, if this person is engaging in some form of illegal activity and there seems to be some domestic violence, should we actually consider whether or not there actually is some type of trafficking or a DV situation? And that is pretty rare to happen um, that I've seen within um, LGBT communities, within um, policing. You know, in fact, for so many of the people I have worked with over the years, the idea of even being able to go to the police is actually a joke. Um, so many of my clients actually had had terrible experiences with the police, whether they've been raped by the police, beaten by the police so badly that breast implants have popped. This is just the experience. And so when victimization happens with that criminalization, there's actually no place to report it for so many people. And even when people try to report it and it actually goes okay, it doesn't often always work out the way it's supposed to. For, so for example, I have a client right now who I'm representing in Texas who experienced horrific levels of domestic violence and was also a victim of trafficking. Um, she was able to go to the police. She got a restraining order. She was, she was in um, a shelter for women who had experienced intimate partner violence. But, th but then her trafficker called ICE on her. And while she was in court getting her restraining order, ICE showed up in court to pick her up. And then all of a sudden she became the criminal. And so even though he was actually the person who was forcing and coercing her to engage in this horrific activities, she was actually the person who was charged with 10, uh, put in jail for 10 years while he got away scot-free. And ICE is not supposed to be arresting people who are getting um, restraining orders. So what ICE did was they actually lied and said, we weren't in court, we weren't in court, we didn't do that. However, there are cameras everywhere now. So even though there were signed statements by ICE claiming they didn't do that, we know better because there was actual video proof that they did that. But were there consequences? No. And is that transgender woman who is a survivor of trafficking at least four times over? Is she still in jail for criminal convictions that she was actually forced to engage into? Yes. And so it's really important for us to have kind of a larger understanding of what the experience is and what people have access to. Um, and even though that's a case from 2017 that made the national news, no one screened her for trafficking and no one thought, wait, we know she's a domestic violence victim. We know she was engaging this illegal activity that it's odd that she would even know how to do hmm, let's take a step back. Um, but that's what happens. And that is what happened. And now she is in jail and we are fighting for her. Um, but she is like so many other people who have been criminalized for things that they were forced to coerced into, for things that they've never done. But this is something that LGBT people, specifically LGBT migrants, see, on, see and experience on a regular basis. Thank you, Lindley, for sharing that. That's a horrific experience. Um, I think kind of building off of, you know, what you just shared, I'm curious if you can speak more to the intersection between forced criminality, domestic violence, trafficking, specifically for LGBT immigrants. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think, number one, we, we don't see um, LGBT people often screened for human trafficking. Um, I've 
I've done this work for a long time and it is pretty rare. There's also this expectation that someone who is LGBT, their experience is gonna fit within the experience of someone who is not LGBT, which sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, but all experiences are unique. Um, and when we're not taking into account people's life experiences and how that impacts how people view what they're going through, we are not gonna actually be able to find the information that we're looking at. So what we often see is, you know, uh, I, I had a case a number of years ago with a client who jumped a hundred thousand dollar bail, um, and she was in a horrific trafficking situation. And she went from uh, organization to organization, and she was literally told to run and hide because no, because of her criminal convictions, no one want and her open warrants and fairness, and no one wanted to help her, and no one thought, oh, wait, is something else going on here? Um, maybe we should take a step back and think maybe asylum isn't the only option for this woman. And, you know, fortunately, we were able to fix the warrants and she got her visa. She actually just got her green card a couple, uh, about a couple months ago, COVID time, you just never know. But we see this so often is this idea that because people have criminal convictions or may be engaging in street-based economies, organizations won't help them. I've had so many people tell me they're being told, they're being turned away because either they're engaging in sex work or they're engaging in some other type of street-based economy in order to survive. And so they're either forced to lie to their attorney or tell the truth and get kicked out. And it's really horrific. And it's a lot of judgment on the part of the attorney, but sometimes people just don't wanna put in that extra work to say, let's take a moment, what's going on here? And how do we create the safest place for you? Because criminalization, unfortunately, is just a reality in so many LGBT people, especially people who are targeted, black and brown trans women. This is just a reality that people face. And when we don't actually understand that and take a step back and make judgments on people's lives, it's really problematic. And it's not something that we should be doing um, if this is the work that we want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lindley, for expanding on that more. Um, and then circling back to Pauline, you kind of spoke to this earlier as well um, in our last question about transgender sensitive sensitivity trainings. I think that I'm curious, you know, when you conduct those trainings, what are the ideas, kind of the big ideas that you hope people will walk away with after those trainings? I also know that's a huge question because, um, you know, trainings are quite extensive, but curious if you could share a bit about that. Well, I could spend a whole training just talking about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, the most important thing that I try to communicate to people, because when people come into my trainings, almost invariably, they have the idea that I'm gonna to talk to them about a tiny percentage of the population who uh, want to undergo hormone replacement therapy and sex reassignment surgery, and I'm going to talk about how people access those procedures. What I want to communicate to people is that this is about all of us. Transgender is uh, about women, it's about men, it's about non-binary and genderqueer people, it's about the structure of our society, and the larger system of the sex gender binary, which is the source of our oppression um, as women, men, boys, girls, non-binary, genderqueer folk, everyone. And so what I really try to communicate, in addition to answering their questions, and they often have questions about very specific things or even questions about me personally, um, is that what we're really talking about is society and for structures of oppression that are inextricably linked uh, with other structures of oppression, such as homophobia and biphobia, HIV AIDS phobia, um, uh, uh, structures of oppression based on race and ethnicity, immigration status, ability, disability, et cetera, et cetera. And so what I really try to communicate in those trainings is these larger structures of oppression which are the vectors which create um, un unfortunately opportunities for um, uh, uh, discrimination 
uh, abuse, harassment, and violence against people who may or may not necessarily identify with the term transgender. Uh, so the, the real challenge is getting people to understand uh, transgender in a larger context, um, while at the same time obviously answering specific questions that people might have. Yeah, I think that, you know, that sounds like fascinating work to kind of learn about the way that people hold this frame of gender and sex without really considering, you know, inserting themselves into it. I think I'm curious, how do you encourage people to do that during the trainings? Well, uh, one little technique is actually I tell jokes. <laughs> because the reality is, that you have to, this is my personal philosophy, and I've been doing this for 20 years, and it works for me. Um, I have to be able to get into your head. Most people who come into my trainings do not think of themselves as prejudiced. And the worst thing you can do, I, I participated in a training once that was kind of foisted on me, and it was the worst training I've ever experienced in my entire life, because um, two people who had no experience in training, uh, they were trans identified, basically engaged in this weird kind of guilt tripping thing, which is the opposite of what I do. What my strategy is to relax people because the worst, what they fear is being called out on their prejudices and being seen as ignorant or bigoted. So you absolutely have to begin by relaxing them. And I do it with humor, I do it with funny stories, I do it with little personal anecdotes. So they see that I'm not going to, you know, point my finger at them and uh, call them out as, you know, some ignorant transphobe, because that immediately stops the thought process, that immediately, you know, uh, instills fear. And what you need to do is relax them to the point where they will ask questions because if they have a question most people in that room have that question and it may sound like a dumb question it may come out in a way that's somewhat inarticulate or awkward but there's something real there that you have to um you have to encounter and interact in order to transform their thinking. Because ultimately what this is about, as far as I'm concerned, is transforming the way society thinks about gender. And you can only do that, you can certainly, uh, you know, answer, respond to questions along the way about hormones or SRS or whatever. But the only way to do that is really to get them to question their own thinking and understand that they have internalized centuries of binary thinking, even to the point, uh, for example, I'll tell stories about, I'll ask the question, how long have we had men's rooms and women's rooms? And people will never think about that. They think that we've had uh, binary public restrooms since the dawn of time, when it's only been, you know, a little over 100, 150 years, really, that we um, had, uh, such as uh, such uh, facilities. And so that's just one example out of hundreds I can think of, of where you kind of hit them with an interesting, odd little thought, and that opens things up because then they go, oh, that's interesting. And they invariably come away, every single training, someone says to me afterwards, you totally blew my mind. And I say, well, you know, that's my job. That's what I do, blow minds. And um, it's because you have to get into their heads and they will only let you into their heads if you relax them sufficiently so that you can draw them out. And then they, then they invite you in and then they start to rethink all this internalized binary thinking from the sex gender binary. And uh, from that point onward, uh, you know, you crack a few jokes, you know, <laughs> um, you uh, tell a few stories, and then pretty soon they're relaxed, and they're actually enjoying it, which is what they're surprised, they're invariably surprised that they enjoy these trainings, because they expect some, you know, either something really dull and factual, or some 
you know, moralizing lecture, tying them not to be transphobic. And that is absolutely the opposite of what I do when I do trainings. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for expanding on that. I think I would also like, and I'm sure others as well would love to hear more of the anecdotes that you share. I'm so curious to hear what those are. Yeah, and by the way, I have a, a kind of a very mini training on my website, pointpark.com. It's really bare bones, but it's basically 10 points. I was invited to a hospital to give a talk. And I said, here are 10 questions you need to ask yourself about how this hospital does business with regard to possible impediments to accessing healthcare for members of this community. And those of them people had never even thought of. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing because they invariably have a very narrow compass when they think about this issue. They invariably are thinking, okay, there's this tiny group of people who want sex reassignment surgery, and we're going to focus on how they get that. And that is one tenth of one percent of what I talk about when I do trainings. But I'll just add one other thing, which is it's what I also do is I really challenge what I call the classic transsexual, transgen uh, uh, classic transsexual transition narrative, which is that there's only one way of being trans. It's this linear uh, progression through a certain set of steps that are, which are spelled out in some handbook that's given to every trans person when they think of transitioning. I don't know who writes this handbook or who publishes it, but that's what people have in their minds because the media, mainstream media are constantly uh, re-articulating this narrative, which denies the fact uh, that the astonishing uh, diversity of the community based on gender identity and expression, as well as other demographics, obviously race, uh, ethnicity, religion, disability, et cetera, et cetera. And as I like to say, there's many different ways being trans as there are transgender people and gender variant people. And so um, communicating that diversity in a way that's interesting to people and understandable to them will actually start them to think about the community as not some you know, small group of people who are over there, who I've never encountered, who uh, want some um, uh, medical interventions that give me the willies just thinking about, rather than uh, recognizing that the issues that face the transgender community are in fact issues that everyone in our society faces in one form or another. I mean, I tell this one anecdote about um, going to uh, a museum and uh, going to the women's room and seeing a woman push a man in a wheelchair into the women's room. And it's, it's a really interesting puzzle because people have this uh, image in their minds, uh, which is completely the opposite of the reality, which is that trans people are uh, the most vulnerable in public restrooms. Uh, they're not the predators, they are the prey as it were. And so I tell the story to get people to think beyond uh, these little boxes about this um, elderly man in a wheelchair and this woman who might have been his, his wife, his sister, his daughter. I didn't know what their relationship was and her pushing him into the women's room. And then I asked them, so why would she push his wheelchair into the women's room? And then they think, oh yeah, because if she pushed him into the men's room, you'd have a woman in the men's room with the urinals and everything else. And so it makes people think, and I said, think about the connection between disability uh, rights and transgender, which is often misconceived. Um, think about access, think about families with young children. Think about a father with a young daughter or a mother with a young son and how uh, the sex gender binary is actually uh, concretized literally and figuratively in the way that we structure public restrooms. And then suddenly they think, oh yes. And then I say, did you realize that we've only had public restrooms uh, divided by um, gender as it were really for a little over 150 years? And uh, it, it kind of blows their minds. And then they suddenly start thinking about 
what they've never thought about or questioned before in their lives. And that's when you start them um, thinking about these larger structures of oppression and how they are mutually reinforcing, how um, uh, enhancing access for trans people can enhance access for people with disabilities, uh, enhance access for uh, uh, families with young children, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, that's what I try to communicate, uh, to bring them in um, and to see that the issues, uh, the impediments that face trans people with regard to healthcare or anything else are actually impediments, oddly enough, that many, many non-trans people in this society face in different ways. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. Definitely very interesting to hear about. Um, and I think something that hopefully will carry outside of this event into our conversations with others as well. Um, and then I also just want to point out in the chat that we shared the links for Mariposa Sin Fronteras and also for Pauline's website. And we'll get TLC's website in there as well. Um, also in the chat there, or sorry, not the chat, there is a separate Q&A section. Um, if folks would like to start writing questions in there, um, we're hoping to pass over to that portion of the event soon. Um, and so then next up, we have another question for Carolina. Um, so I think, you know, as we've been hearing all of these different perspectives, all related to immigration, um, you know, just thinking about the intersection of diversity, um, of all of the diverse identities that LGBT people have, it makes it that much clearer that detention is not a viable solution to the safety of LGBT immigrants. So I think, Carolina, I'm curious as to your perspective, um, what, what types of alternatives do you envision as opposed to immigration detention? Okay, Carolina, um, tantas perspectivas que hemos escuchado sobre la diversidad de la identidad dentro de la comunidad LGBT. Es obvio que la detención no es una solución viable para cualquier persona para mantener su seguridad. Um, Carolina, me, me interesa su perspectiva sobre alternativas que se imagina a la detención. Sí, gracias. Ah, bueno, para mí es muy, es muy importante que haya más educación, que haya más oportunidades de trabajo, que haya más oportunidades de vivienda, uh, vivienda para todos, uh, que haya más oportunidad de, uh, de salud para la comunidad transgénero, que haya más oportunidades de, de, uh, de leyes más justas. Yes, thank you so much. For me, it's really important that there are more opportunities for education, more work opportunities, more housing opportunities for everyone, more health care opportunities, especially for transgender people, and more just laws. También más oportunidades y más trabajo y más cuidado para la mujer transgénero de edad avanzada, también para, la, para las comunidades uh, LGBT en general y también uh, especialmente a la comunidad transgénero con uh, dificultades de salud mental o, o incapacitadas. Also more opportunities for health care for trans women, especially those who are um, older in age and um, also LGBT people, especially transgender and especially also um, thinking about um, the health conditions. Perdón, no, no, la última frase otra vez, por favor. No recuerdo, no recuerdo, <laughs> pero okay. no está bien, uh -huh. pero sí, más oportunidades de trabajo, más leyes más justas, okay. eh, eh, ah, oportunidades de, de, de vivienda para todos eh, y, y este, la vivienda gratis o oportunidades de, uh -huh. de todo. Pues. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, just like I was saying, more opportunities for work and for housing and for more just laws and, and free housing as well. 
Thank you, Carolina. Yes, all definitely very important things and much better alternatives than the current oppressive immigration detention system that we have. Sí, claro, gracias, Carolina. Um, mucho, estoy de acuerdo, más alternativas al sistema de opresión de detención que tenemos ahora. Sí, claro. Uh, un, la detención no es una opción. La detención no debe de existir para nadie, para ningún ser humano, para, para, ni para animales tampoco. No creo que una cárcel o una detención sea, un, sea algo bueno para alguien. Yes, of course, of course. I don't believe that detention should be an option for anyone at all. No human being should be detained, not even animals. And so um, I don't believe in the, the jail and detention. That... Absolutely, yes, definitely very much in agreement. Sí, estoy muy de acuerdo. So, our first question that we have, I think, is perhaps a good question for you as well, Carolina. Um, I'll let Robin translate that before I go on. Is this the question from Matthew? Oh, yes. Uh, sorry. Okay, I, okay. I can go ahead and read it. Yeah. Okay, um, I got it. I just, I just wasn't sure that was the answer. Si la primera pregunta viene de Matthew, dice, ¿qué puedo hacer para ayudar? Uh, la pregunta es para mí. Para todos, pero usted sí, pues, primero. <risas> para todos, pero yo estaba pensando que pues tal vez es un poco relacionado a lo que nos estaba contando. Sí, ah, pues envolverse, envolver, eh, eh, ver el trabajo que estamos haciendo y, 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 y se quiere apoyar en lo que estemos haciendo también. O también empujar a los congresistas para que haya más leyes más justas, para que haya más oportunidades de trabajo, para que haya más vivienda para la comunidad. Empujar, empujar, Bien. empujar. Mm -hmm. Get involved. Look at the kind of work that we're doing. Um, support us. Push the Congress members to pass more fair laws. Um, just look at our work and, and push, push, push. Y alzar las voces de las mujeres transgénero. Lift up the voices of transgender women. Thank you, Carolina. Um, I think I'm also just so that folks know, you know, where they can get involved in that. Um, can we find those opportunities on your website or is there a social media channel that's best to connect with? Para saber cómo, eh, hay una página web o un lugar donde podría mirar la gente para involucrarse, Carolina? Sí, tenemos nuestra página de Facebook, es ahí donde ponemos más la, 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 lo que estamos haciendo también si quieren a, apoyar necesitamos muebles para, para la casa mariposa, vamos a necesitar muebles vamos a necesitar camas vamos a necesitar este, pintura, vamos a necesitar varias cosas que nos puedan apoyar, ropa es, estamos reabriendo otra vez casa mariposa, estamos reabriendo el programa, es, vamos a volver a abrir esta casa para poder a, a ver a recibir a, a mujeres transgénero y comunidad LGBT. Entonces, si nos pueden seguir a nuestra página de Facebook, que es Mariposas Sin Fronteras, o también, uh, uh -huh. perdón, o también uh -huh. en, en Instagram, que es Casa Mariposa. Uh, actually, our Facebook page would be a good place. Um, that's where you can see what we're up to. Right now, we're really needing things like um, furniture and beds um, for the um, Casa Mariposa that's going to be opening up paint, uh, several things, clothing. We're op reopening the house, the Casa Mariposa. We're op reopening our program. We're going to be receiving women again. Um, and so you can look at our Facebook, uh, Mariposa Sin Fronteras, or our Instagram for Cas Casa Mariposa. Y vamos a poner, vamos a estar poniendo fotografías del antes y después de cada cosa que vamos, vamos a estar reparando. También necesitamos reparar el piso y, vamos, y tenemos que pintar. We're going to be hanging up um, photographs of before and after as well. You'll see all of the repairs that we're doing. Uh, we need a new floor. And so um, you'll be able to see that at casa, the Casa Mariposa. 
en que, que queremos que, que Casa Mariposa sea un lugar seguro para la comunidad aquí en Tucson. Entonces estamos reconstruyendo, estamos, eh, estamos haciendo muchas cosas. Así es, eh, hay muchas cosas que, que tengo en mente, pero tal vez los nervios no me, no, no me, no me dejen sacar todo lo que tengo en mente. Pero síganos, síganos y vean ahí todo lo que vamos a hacer. We want Casa Mariposa to be a safe place here in Tucson. Um, so we're um, doing these construction problems, or so many things. I've got so many things that are on my mind right now, but maybe not all of the, um, the ways to put them into practice. But please follow us. Thank you so much, Carolina. Muchísimas gracias, Carolina, por compartir eso. Um, and we encourage everyone to follow Mariposa Sin Fronteras on Facebook. Go out and donate and help us out. All right, so I think that we're just about ready to wrap up. Um, but before we do that, I want to check with our other panelists as well. Um, if any of you have any closing remarks that you would like to say, anything that we can do to help out with the work that you're doing. Lindley? Sure. Um, you know, I, I definitely think um, what Carolina said about funding is so important. Really take time. If you're going to give your money, give it to grassroots organizations like Carolina's, like so many others. Big national organizations get money all the time um, and get recognized. And it's the grassroots organization, which is which are usually trans led, trans women of color led that are just doing the groundbreaking work and are saving lives. Um, so I think that's one, one thing I wanna just um, raise up of what Carolina already said. And then the other thing is, um, you know, uh, at TLC, we do a lot of different um, campaigns, um, a lot of work with LGBT migrants, um, a lot of work with people in detention. And we always need people to support that work by um, contacting elected officials, by signing petitions. I know sometimes you don't think it's the biggest deal or it's that helpful, but it actually really makes a difference. And we are going to be having another one coming out soon for the client I was talking about in Texas. Please keep your eyes out for that. Um, we need to get her out of jail. We need to get her out of detention because that's where she's going next. Um, and she, she has a right to be safe and free um, and she's not right now. So I really encourage you all to take a look um, and to follow, I, I, I guess we have a Twitter. Um, I'm so bad with social media, um, but it is on our website. Um, and really take a look and try to follow us and sign up for those types of things because they make a huge difference um, in, in people's lives and in people's legal cases. ¿Puedo decir algo? Espero que podamos yeah. seguir trabajando juntos eh, o todas las organizaciones para poder tener a la comunidad transgénero segura, para poder ten, abrir también Casa Mariposa y poder recibir a, a todas las mujeres que quieran, que estén saliendo de las detenciones y quieran venir para vivir una vida mejor en los Estados Unidos. I hope we continue to work all together to have a safe place like Casa Mariposa, where we can receive women who are getting out of detention or are coming to the United States to find safety. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Carolina. Um, I definitely would love to keep working together with all of us. I think this has been a wonderful conversation. And thank you to everyone. Um, sí, pues claro, Carolina, muchísimas gracias por decirnos esto. Um, yo estoy muy emocionada de haberle conocido en, en este evento y pues qué buena la conversación que hemos tenido esta noche y espero um, trabajar juntos en, en el futuro también. All right, um, does anyone have any other closing remarks that they would like to say? Uh, feel free uh, to contact me. Uh, at Pauling Park on Twitter, Pauling Park at earthlink.net, uh, through email, through my website, PaulingPark.com. If you want to follow my work, or even better yet, get involved, particularly if you're in New York, um, it would be wonderful to see more people get involved with this work. And also find me if you are interested in transgender sensitivity training, do consider someone who's trans identified, 
but has specific experience doing transgender sensitivity trainings, not just someone who does LGBT trainings, which really means LGB, or much less someone who just does general corporate diversity training because they will have virtually no background in uh, on, on transgender issues. Uh, it's really important. Public education is the work of all of us, whether we're paid or not, and it's all the better if we do get paid, but regardless, we can all have an impact in helping educate the public on all these important issues, which ultimately really um, intersect. They're all ultimately part of one big puzzle in terms of interlocking structures of oppression, but, you know, working together uh, as Carolina said, we can really accomplish a great deal. Absolutely, thank you, Pauline. Um, and then I also just would like to say that um, for all of you on here who are practitioners who work with people who are in immigration detention, um, a colleague of mine and I run a project called Books for Migrants um, and we provide funding for books, journals, crossword puzzles, anything that people who are detained for long periods of time might find themselves in need of um, during the hardships of immigration detention. So please feel free to reach out to us at booksformigrants at gmail.com. And I'll pop that in the chat as well. All right, I think that that is everything that we had. Um, but thank you so much to everyone who attended. Thank you so much to all of our wonderful panelists for sharing with us, not just your professional experiences, but your personal experiences as well. Um, you know, I feel like this has been a really great opportunity to get to learn more, not just about LGBT issues, but, um, you know, about how all of this comes together and that we've all got to keep fighting alongside one another. So thank you all. It's been great. <laughs>